morning. Good morning. Woo. All right. I'm going to attempt to get through this offering without crying. All right. I'm going to get started right away. I took a lot of notes from the storehouse book. Um, I'm going to read Mark 12, verses 41 through 44. It says, Jesus sat down opposite of the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins, worth only a fraction of a penny. Verse 43 says, calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. So this demonstrates her willingness to give all she possibly could. And in John chapter 13, verse 16, we see that God also gave. And it reads, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So love gives. Always consider this to be true, that will yield your great reward in this life. We must learn to give if we say we love. Your storehouse will be filled and available to give when you walk in obedience to the scriptures and become a willing giver. This is a foundational principle and will always produce results. So as we give today, let's just remember that Jesus literally held nothing back on the cross. He willingly gave his all, a debt that we could not pay was fully paid. We do not give out of manipulation. We hold nothing back. When we give our all, we give willingly, we give cheerfully, knowing that our inheritance is in heaven. We reap from the storehouses of storehouses. And in the storehouse book, I just want to read something quick. It says, our ultimate reaping comes from the storehouse of Father, the ultimate storage vaults of heaven. Bounty is his garden, his water, his wealth, his resource, which has no limit. So there is no end to his supply. And this is your inheritance when you sow according to scripture. So love gave. Love gave you an inheritance. So willingly give your all to the storehouse. So let's pray. Lord, I just thank you. I thank you for the ability to give. I thank you, Lord, that we are going to give differently today. We're going to give all that we have to you, Lord. We're no longer going to hold back. And Lord, remind us that Jesus gave it all on the cross. So our giving is our response to what he did on the cross. We hold nothing back. In Jesus' name, amen. Wow. Wow. Jesus. Jesus. Mm. She she might have we, we might just be able to to say praise the name of the Lord and amen. Because the young prophet preached. 
glory to the name of God. I can tell you right now from that bit of ministry just just there, I got a glimpse into heaven. I got a glimpse into the throne room. I got a glimpse at the one who loves us and loved us so much that he gave his very life. And I, I'm, I'm grateful to be able to start what the Lord gave me on from that platform. So I bless the name of Jesus Christ today. And may I add my own prayer in that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart, oh God, right now will be acceptable in your sight. And Father, we know it's not by might and it's not by power, but it is by your spirit. And so spirit of the living God, as you are already here, I pray that you will be pleased to continue to abide right here. I pray that the words that you've given me will come across effectively that you are seen and I am not, so that you are heard and I am not, so that your instructions are given. Let any lingering flesh, not so much as us, but the will of the enemy that will want to penetrate this time of ministry, be nullified even right now in the matchless name of Jesus. For we lift you high. Yahweh, we lift you high. Father, I, I, I see that this time of ministry, yes, we call it preaching, but oh my God, I'm going to worship my way through this to give what you have said. Oh, Rabo Shatera Makase. God, I bless. God, I so bless. I so bless. I so bless. I so bless your name today, oh God. Yeshua Hamashiach. With my heart, with my mouth, with my mind, with my body, I worship and adore you and be magnified in this time, in this space. I do pray. And so my family, my family from all over the place, I greet you in that name that is above every name. I greet you in that name that demons have to bow humans will bow everything made everything seen or unseen bows to that name and so i greet you and i do call you family sincerely family and so i'll, I'll give you something of a joke because the lord likes to play jokes on me when i was given my assignment as we're all given whose turn it is to deliver the word. And I'm going to stop with the, I am changing a lot of my language as the Lord is changing me, as the Lord is revealing more and more of himself to me and what we as ministers of this gospel is meant to do. Yes, we are preachers. I know that, but we need something more today than just to say that we are preaching. We are delivering the living word of the most high God. See then, and, and when we just shift the way we say things, the delivery of what God wants us to do changes. And we grab and grasp the audience that he intends for us to actually reach. And so the Lord played a little bit of a trick on me that when it was my turn to deliver his word, I didn't realize it was Resurrection Sunday. Had not the first idea. And so basically, if I had the thought to put together some little cutesy little resurrection, I really don't do that. But just in case I fell to the pressure, I didn't realize. I'm like, oh, it's Resurrection Sunday. Have any of you ever heard the Lord laugh? I have, I have, and I've been the brunt of the joke. <laughs> I've heard the Lord laugh and delight to me 
And I've heard him laugh like, hey, I got you, didn't I? And this was one of those times. So the sermon that I am going to, or the word that I'm going to deliver is the word that he just downloaded. He downloaded in, in my spirit. And the funniest thing was he gave me one word that I had to sweat, that I had to labor to bring what he is saying out. And I'm actually honored that he would even say, girl, you'll figure it out. You know, I'm with you, I got this. So the one word that he gave me was altars. Altars. On Resurrection Sunday, he gave me altars. Now, insert Bertha, who immediately says to the Lord, altars, how on earth am I going to preach about altars? Altars is, first of all, God, everybody knows what an altar is. And outside of that, that's such a broad one word, but it's a broad subject, isn't it? And God, as Christians, we know what altars are. And his immediate response was, do you? Do you really? Do you understand what altars are? Do you really think my people know what altars truly are and what I mean for them to do? do and how I mean for them to function and how I mean for you all to interact with them, do they really? And that shut my mouth. It shut my mouth to the, okay, I've got questions now. And so the questions led to the pursuit of what the word actually says. So we know very well uh, in the most layman's term let's, let's let's take it let's take it where we most understand it we believe that the altar is that place that we go up to in an erected building called the church a church building and we believe that is the place that at the end of the of the service at the end of the message we call people to the altar and 9 times out of 10 people come to the altar in their tears, in their seeking of search and searching for something, they often come at the um, invitation of the person who's ministering. They come for an invitation to receive Christ as Lord. This is what happens in churchdom. This is what happens um, in the kingdom that, that we have somehow decided that it would be. And the Lord wants me to remind us all today that we have got it wrong. We've got it wrong. We've decided what altars are and what their function is, and we've left the Lord himself out of it. The Lord is reminding me today, he's reminding me that an altar is a place of sacrifice, and the altar is a place of death. If I did not give you the theme, let me give it now. You know the gist of it. But the theme that the Lord gave me is the altars we erect, meaning the altars that we build, the altars that we decided that is um, satisfactory to the Lord, the altars that we say that fits in our idea of Christendom, the altars that fit in our, our ideas of how church is supposed to function. So we've left the Lord of the altar out so that we can put our ideologies, our dogmas that we insist on calling doctrines into the house of God. An altar is a place where there's supposed to be fire and fire from the living God. I haven't even gotten to the scriptures yet, but I'm saying I'm going to give this the way the Lord gave it to me. And he opened my eyes. 
He's shown me this before, but now he is emphatically speaking it again. And when the Lord is emphatically speaking something, we have to pay attention because he is on the move. And if we don't want to be left out, we've got to move while he's moving. I bring you back to early on in scripture when the cloud, when the fire was over the mountain, it was a signal that you were supposed to get up and move. And when that fire rose and started moving, Israel realized that they were supposed to get up and move as well. Well, he's still speaking from the mountaintops today, but are we listening? He's still speaking. He's still directing. But are we listening and are we following? So I want to say to I want to give a brief um if I can get this thing to go. Here we go. Because we will do things in decency and in order. So in accordance to Baker's Evangelical Dictionary of Biblical Theology, an altar is defined as a structure on which offerings are made to a deity. Notice it says to a deity. Anything that can that we allow to be an object of worship can be a deity. So the Hebrew word for altar is misbia. And in case anybody wants it, it's spelled M I Z B E A H and it's pronounced misbia. And from that Hebrew word, we get the meaning of to slaughter, to slaughter, to kill. And not to leave out the Greek, the Greek renders this word as, and it's a tongue twister, it's thusiasterion, thusiasterion, and I will spell it. It is T-H-U. S-I-A-S-T-E-R-I-O-N. And this word means a place of sacrifice. So a true altar is a place where something dies in order to be a sacrifice. And I'm not going to, like I said, this is not a resurrection day message. The Lord didn't even allow it. But I will put in the fact that this is exactly what we're looking at in the person of Jesus Christ. He was bruised for our iniquity. He was killed. He received many stripes. I heard the apostle say the 39 stripes. Whipped, beaten, spat on and then placed on the cross as our sacrifice. So from this def definition, we can see what is supposed to happen on an altar. And we, most of us, if we were members of a church or we visited a church, we would get a good visual of what an altar is, won't we? So praise God. So what are we saying here? We believe we understand the purpose of an altar. If we go by the definition that was just given, we'll say, yes, I got it. I understand what is supposed to happen on an altar. Okay, so we say we got it. Then why are we misusing the altar? Why are we misappropriating the altar? Why are we doing the very things that Israel herself did by misusing the altar? Who can agree with me today that the God that we serve, the God that we know is a jealous God and he will not share his glory with anybody? Who can agree with me today that Israel, who was supposed to be the apple of God's very eye and in fact not supposed to be, they are deemed to be the apple of God's very eye, but they had roaming eyes. Throughout history, we can see that they had roaming eyes that caused them to wander in pursuit of other gods from the nations that surrounded them. 
And what of we? What of we today? Are we doing the same as Israel did so long ago as a nation? Are we as Christians today saying we we like? I love that last song that the, um, the singer said that he would be the sacrifice. He would be the worship. He would be the offering. And what he sings would be more than a song. But are we still just doing things by root? Are we still just singing the songs? They sound good. Are we still just allowing the super official um, aspect of worship and worship singing and, and preaching and all of that? Are we just allowing for a superficial experience and never allowing all that God intended for us to reach us to the very depths of our hearts, to the very depths of our soul, whereby we will be changed and conformed into the image of who he is? There is no new thing under the sun, says the Lord. So all history ever does is repeat itself. And we have to watch where we are on that loop of repeat. Or we are in sin. So who can agree with me today that the pursuit and worshiping of other gods, regardless of what they call themselves, will not work out well for us. It did not work out well for Israel and it will not work out for us. While I was studying, while I was researching, and um, I guess I forever got the nickname from, I won't mention her name, but she knows who she is, but I am the apostle, um, is it a title? Apostle nerd. I am the nerd. I am the geek. And that's all right with me because I will dig. I want to give the truth and I don't want it. And here's, oh, Holy Spirit. He just inserted this. There are altars being set up all over the place that we don't even understand that we are looking at everything that we're looking at that is outside of God is because there's been an altar. There's been a sacrifice that has been set up to allow certain things to have a voice in this world. And if Christians are not careful, we pick up the verbiage. And I'm gonna explain what I mean by that. Because I was just getting ready to say my truth. There's that catchphrase that's in the world today that I'm going to speak my truth. And you hear it everywhere. Listen to any reel, you know, on, on like Instagram. Listen to any program. L read anything you want. Somebody is always now proclaiming their truth. When there is only one truth. Because I'm sure I heard the Lord say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes unto the Father except by me. But now people are rising up and everybody's got a truth. Everybody's got their own story to tell. And what the, 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 the Christian world, the, those of us who say that we are for Christ, these little, they seem small, but we're told that a little leaven causes the whole loaf to rise. And so we're sleeping because we don't catch them. We don't catch these things quickly and rebuke them and send them back from whence they came. So now everyone's got my truth. I can name so many. What, uh, here's, here's one. Forgive me if it sounds facetious. I see Pastor Angelo in, in there. He's the only male that I can visibly see, but I'm gonna ask him, he don't really have to answer me, but I'm gonna ask him how many times he was pregnant. How many times, Pastor Angel, were you ever pregnant? But now the world going around talking about we pregnant. We're pregnant. When any of we get pregnant, if you're not a woman, we ain't never, pastor, thank you for the production of the seed that allowed your wife to bring forth your child from your loins, but dude, you ain't never been pregnant. So now we got my truth. We're, we're, we're pregnant. Um, we start um, diseases that we get to our, in, in our bodies. We 
start putting the word M M Y in front of it, and now you name the disease and call it your own instead of rebuking and, and um, evicting that thing. It's not mine. It is a squatter. God gave me all things that pertain to life and godliness. He said, I am the Lord that healeth thee. Come on, somebody. He says, yeah, I bring healing in my wings. And you busy talking about my C-A-N, blah, 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 my high blood pressure, my diabetes. The devil is a lie. It ain't mine. I don't want it to get out. So this is what happens when we allow, and the problem is we don't see these things as altars. And I'm going to give it the way the Lord showed it to me. We don't understand that the things that we put our attention to, the things that we allow and start interacting with and let it knit and blend into our way of lives becomes an altar, becomes a place of sacrifice, becomes a place of death. And unfortunately, it is the church, not the, the church, but the people who make up the church who are doing the dying, but not dying in the right way. We're supposed to die to the things of the world. But instead, we're dying before our deem time from the from the lord we're dying to 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 um righteousness we're dying to the love of god we're dying to discipling um nations with the we're allowing the great commission not to have the force and the effect that it's supposed to have because we're adopting the verbiage of this world and if we're adopting the things of the world Guess what? We are rejecting God. So I tried to find out how many times it was that Israel rejected God by running after other gods. I might as well tell you here and now I gave up because I found repeatedly and if repeatedly could represent a number that would be how many times they turned their backs on the Lord repeatedly over and over and over and over again. Did they set up altars to the gods of the Canaanites? Did they set up Asherah poles? Did they worship and bow down to Baal or Baal? Whichever way you want to say it. So the Bible records their apostasy like this. And Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. We find this written over and over and over in scripture. And what was it that they did that angered the Lord so much? God says, I am the Lord thy God. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. I know that's all King James's, but y'all get it. Listen, in plain English, God saying, I am God. I created you. I created you. So you are not to worship anybody but me. You're not to worship anyone by way, by way of something that's made from out of the earth, by way of something that's made from stone, by way of something that's made from brick or metal. We read in Exodus chapter 20 verse 1 through 6 and i know i printed it somewhere and i'll find it somewhere or i'm gonna have to quote it also another way lord i got too many notes have mercy let me just grab it genesis 20 1 through 6. people know genesis 20 specifically to be the Ten Commandments. But before we ever got there, we had, I am the Lord your God, which hath brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You will not have any other gods before me. You will not make unto yourselves any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You will not bow down yourself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, 
visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Now, what are we seeing here? What are we understanding here? God says that we are to worship no God but himself. God says that we are to build no altars unto anyone but himself. I'm going to give you the scriptures that the Lord has been speaking to just for the essence of time. And then we're going to break some things down. I gave you Exodus chapter 20 verses one through six. I would now like to give you first Kings chapter 18 and where did I stop? It was really the whole chapter, but I want to focus now on verse on verses, let's see how we'll better do it. Let's say the whole chapter and then let me just speak my way through it. So Elijah was one of the prophets that refused to bow down to Ahab, to Jezebel, to the form of worship that was plaguing the land of Israel. And Elijah decided to put or pit the God of Israel to the supposed gods who are called Baal or Asherah or sometimes called Astoreth. And we know the story. The story goes like this. Elijah called forth the 450 Baal prophets and called his people together. And they built something like a trench and they put offerings on it. And they poured water on it. And he told the prophets of Baal, since there's so many of you, you go ahead and do what you do to awaken your gods. You go ahead and do what you do in worship to your gods. I'll wait. I got time. I got time. Y'all go ahead. And what did they do? They cried out of the name of Baal. I like to say it the right way, Baal. They cried out in the name of Baal. Morning, noon, till evening. And they started cutting themselves. Baal, wake up, Baal, wake up, Baal, do your thing. Come on, we, we, you know, you're making us look bad here. Can I paraphrase? And Elijah sat back. Now, in between of, in, in all of that, and this is what the Lord is putting to us today. I want to read to you verse 21. Elijah went before the people and said, how long will you waver between two opinions? Some of you, if you're older school, you would, you would have heard halt between two opinions. If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. In verse 22, e Elijah has what many of us have today. We're looking with our physical eyes instead of looking with the eyes of the spirit. The physical eyes are always going to lie to you. The physical eyes are, are linked to this world and the world system. So the physical eyes told Elijah, I am the only one of the Lord's prophets left. But Baal has 450 prophets. Not so. There were a hundred prophets that the Lord reserved that were hiding out in caves that were intercessing, that were praying. You don't know where your help comes from. You don't know where the Lord reserves help from because uh, your help comes from the Lord. You might not see little old me in the Cayman Islands interceding for you over there in North Carolina. You might not see Miss Carolina interceding for, for um. 
um, up there on that mountain where that girl lives. <laughs> Liz's mountain, y'all get what I mean? Just because you don't see does not mean, God. Well, listen, we serve the invisible God who is only manifested in the person of Jesus. So if you look at the world with your limited intellect, with your limited sight, you're going to think that you are alone. But God says, I will never leave you, nor while I forsake you, and lo, I'm with you until the end of the age. But let's count, let's give Elijah some slack. Even though he thought he was alone, he was still willing to build an altar unto the living and true God. You got to give the man his props. He like, Lord, I'm by myself over here, but I'm going to serve you. That's what I want to put into our hearts right now. That's what I want to put into our spirits right now. It might look like you're by yourself. It might look like you don't have no backup. It might look like the church board not didn't hear the same message that, that, that the Lord gave you. And while you're hanging a right, they're hanging a left. It might look like confusion, but the God of order, the God God of peace, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. He is right there in the midst. And when the time is right to come forth and show his power, he's going to do it. And he's going to answer by fire. He's going to answer by fire. Now, here's what my problem is here. Elijah went before the people and said, how long will you waver between two opinions? Why am I talking ancient biblical history? Well, one reason is that the word of God doesn't change because God himself doesn't change. He is the immutable God. And so what was true in Elijah's day is true today. Look at the church today. They are divided. They are wavering. They are halting between the things of the world and the things of God. Why? Because they succumb to popularity. Why? Because they succumb to their images. Why? Because they have built altars that will not hold. They have built altars where there's no real death. There's no real sacrifice. In fact, in some cases, they have abandoned the altar altogether. And so there is a schizophrenic spiritual spirit. Wow, that was a mouthful to spit out. There is spiritual schizophrenia going on in the churches today. The people of God don't know which way to go. The people of God don't know what to believe. And I've, I'm saying it and I've heard other people say it. If you are in a congregation somewhere that is not preaching the undiluted word of God, don't walk out, run, run. You better run. And so. What do I want to say? What do I want to say? Altars can be and are a blessed place when they are surrendered to the Lord God Almighty. Altars is a place of horrific death. Otherwise, so I'd like to take you, God has given me so much. If you know the amount of notes I got here, you will laugh. But Holy Spirit, help me put this together in a way that is going to please you. What we need today is this. We need soldiers, warriors, servants, preachers, pastors, teacher, apostle, every last one of us that make up the church, here's what we need. We need someone who is brave enough to call foul on what we are seeing today. We need a church, a body of Christ that's willing to tear down false altars wherever we find them. We need the boldness of those who says, guess what? If you throw me off the board, I don't care. If you throw me out of the house, I don't care. If you don't let me up to the pulpit to preach again, then I don't care because I'm going to preach in spirit and in truth. We 
the, the account of Josiah, Second, Second Kings, chapter twenty-three. I'm going to paraphrase it, but I want you to know where I'm coming from, because this is what the Lord is talking about today. Israel, because of its harlotry, and I can say that because that's literally in the Word of God, because of its harlotry. Because there's no children here, because Israel went a whoring, because Israel prostituted herself. They were invaded. They were captured, exiled, and made to serve the very gods now that they all of a sudden they don't want anything to do with. But because of their harlotry, the Lord turned his back to them. And he allowed invading armies like, like the Ammonites, like the Syrians, like the Midianites. They were captured. And so after many years of this, after Manasseh, after Ahab, for one, for two, after Jeroboam, who started it, for three, King after king after king forgot the ways of the Lord and allowed Israel to be open to attack. When you worship at a false altar, which in effect is worshiping to Satan himself, and I wish we could get that communication, we are made by God to worship. We are designed, it is in our DNA to worship. If you're not worshiping the one and true God, you are by default worshiping Satan. There ain't no two ways about it. We want to play that game and say that our compromise ain't hurting nothing. Uh, 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 yeah, I go to church on, on Sunday. Uh, oh, yeah, uh, and, and I partied all Saturday. I was in the club all Saturday, but I made it to church, so God forgive me. Uh, I, 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 I'm having marital difficulty, so God understand why I look to another man. God understand the misery that I'm in. God understand why I look to another woman. No, you are halting between two opinions. Joshua said, choose this day who you will serve. And he said, as for me and my house, I'm going to serve the Lord. And I probably said this on this, on this platform before. Sometimes in your own house, you're saying as for me and my house, but there's the vision in your house. We're going to serve the Lord. Sometimes in your own house, you might be the only one who's lighting the right fire. You might be the only one who's bowing down to the proper altar. It's coming down to this. And this is not what we're understanding. It's coming down so succinctly. Like this. Where the decision has to be made. Whatever's happening around me, I'm going to serve God. Whatever's happening in the systems of the world, I'm going to serve God. Whatever altars are being built, you will not see a hint of me. So where was I? I told you 2 Kings chapter 23. After many years of captivity, on and off again, on and off again, on and off again, there rose a boy king by the name of Josiah. He was eight years old when he became king. How many of you know, sometimes you got to do away with the antiquated ways of doing things. You got to do away with the, um, I hate to say it, those who are older and think they are wise, but they're full of foolishness. And so it came to the attention of Josiah that the book of law was found in the temple. Somebody answer this for me. Why was it lost in the first place that it had to be found? Why were the precepts and the way to follow God ever misplaced? But there they were. There they were. So one of the priests brought the book of law. Some translations call it the book of agreement. Because they agreed that they would follow the precepts of, of the Lord. But somehow the word got discarded. 
somehow the word got discarded. At the proper time, the book was found and the book was read to Josiah. And he realized why Israel, by that time he was 18 years old. So 10 years after his initial entrance into reigning, the book was found, buried, discarded. Is this what we, the church, are doing today? Burying and discarding the word of truth? Is this what we're about today? Unfortunately, yes. Yes. Today, people say Easter. I do will not say Easter, but that's what people, the world is out there celebrating. So they out there in their, in their finery. They're out there in their wide hats. They're out there in their pretty dresses. They're out there in their slacks. They're out there partying. They're out there doing all whatever. I purposely didn't get dressed up today. If you look at what I got on, my shirt is a t-shirt and it's, it says, Jesus, Jesus at the door. I can't even get Jesus at the door. If any day you're supposed to be about your father's business is today. Let somebody know he is risen. Jesus at the door. Come on. And so. The book of law is read and the young man gets to realize why they are in the predicament that they are in. And unlike other kings and unlike other rulers, he immediately moved just to action. What was the action that was needed? The rulers before him and even the priests who were supposed to guard the temple were doing things contrary to the law. They were eating the, the, the sanctified bread with the common folk. So the priests, the Levites were eating with the common folk, right? And they had Asherah poles in every high place. Asherah was the goddess, quote unquote, of fertility. Baal was supposed to be the sun god and the god of rain. So they called them the storm god or the thunder god. You need to understand this. So they were believing these false gods for successful um, harvest. And they were believing this false goddess for fertility. Manasseh, Jeroboam, Ahab, all of those former kings caused their children to walk through or pass through the fire. They were into um, child sacrifice. And this is why the Lord was destroying them one by one, was allowing the nations to come just for the background for anyone who do, do, doesn't know it. And then you can look at those scriptures on your own time. But Josiah did something that the Lord is requiring us today. And this is my point. I don't want to um, be over long. I'll try to stay within the time. But what Josiah did is what the Lord is requiring us who name the name of Christ today. He listened intently to the word of God. He saw the shortcomings. He saw the disobedience. And let me insert here and now. To the rebellious, I need us to understand operating in rebellion operating in disobedience, operating in disrespect, up, uh, disrespecting your leaders, disrespecting your parents, disrespecting um, the good laws that are set in place is setting up altars. This is why, what we don't understand. Anytime you disobey a direct law, a direct order you have set up an ungodly altar and you have incurred a curse and somebody would say maybe somebody would say maybe not this audience but they would say that's not enough to bring a curse yes it is a curse does not land without a good reason 
Rebellion is a good reason for a curse to land. Disobedience is a is is um a good reason for a curse to land. And I just read to you Exodus chapter twenty verses one through six. If you look at verses four and five, you will see that peace. The Lord himself said, failure to abide by my word will allow a curse to come upon you to the third and fourth generation. Some of us wonder why we're suffering the curse of poverty. Some of us are wondering why we're suffering with early death in our family line. Somebody was wondering why we're operating under a vagabond spirit. Somebody set you up three and four generations ago, and it's going to take the blood of Jesus himself to undo it. We need to rebuild the altars and sacrifice properly is what we need to do. And this is what Josiah did. And this is what heavily impacted me. And I believe it heavily impacts me because it heavily impacted the Lord. And he wants us to know this. When Josiah saw how very far Israel had strayed, he gathered the ones that he knew were obedient, who were walking in the ways of the Lord. And every temple where Baal was set up and every high place where Astoreth was erected. Remember that this message is called the altars that we erect. And so every altar and every false God that was erected in the face of the one true living God was hewn down, was cut down. And that wasn't even enough for Josiah. And this is the radical sense that we've got to have. It was not even enough. What did he do after that? He had them gathered. Every last one of those poles. He had them gathered and he had them burned and he ground it down to powder. I felt that in the Holy Ghost. I felt the righteous indignation when he understood, when he understood the darkness, when he understood how evil it was to have those poles erected and people bowing down to them. He ground them down to powder. May I say this is the job of the present day church. May I say that God is calling on us here and now to cast down, tear down, break down, knock down, destroy everything that exalts itself. Every imagination we cast down in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus Christ that would try to erect itself higher than that of the God that we serve. And may we knock such things down burn it to hallelujah with pure sacrifice come on somebody burn it and may we grind it down into powder and then may we strew it throw it the bible says that he took it and threw it on the graves of the common and he could do it you know why because in israel to to, to mess around with with dead things is 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 is, is um a desecration is it's unclean and unholy. He put the filth where the filth belong. He put those non-serving gods who are not alive. He put those non-serving, non-living gods with the dead. That's what he did. And that's what we have to do. That's what we got to do. We got to take what does not live. We got to take what cannot serve. We got to take what does not function. And we got to be responsible for the houses that we have been given responsibility to. We've got to take this message that the Lord has given us to the people that we've been given delegated authority to. We cannot wink and we cannot sleep. We've got to call out sin where we find it. And we've got to take it and grind it down till there's nothing left. Till there's nothing left. And then we re-enterate who you're going to serve. Choose this day who you will serve. Judges chapter 6. I'm not going to read it because time is, 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 is going. We find Gideon. We know the story. Gideon is hiding in a wine press. 
He's in the wine press, shucking the wheat. And why is he in a deep, deep wine press? Because he's got to hide. Because marauding armies have come in. That, and it's armies that the Lord himself allowed. Why? Because of false worship. Because they are again under judgment. But the people began to cry out. And that's the good thing about God. He gives space. He gives time for repentance. And when true repentance does reach his ears, when true up repentance and worship and attention to God reaches his nostrils, he does respond. He rejects false worship, but he will respond to true worship. And people started genuinely crying out to the Lord again. And then the Lord of hosts himself shows up and calls him man of valor, brave man. And he says, I got a job for you to do, paraphrasing it. And he listens and he tests the Lord, but he listens and he tears down the Baals. He knocks down their figures. Did you know, do you know the story? That when the people found out that it was him that destroyed the Baals, the, the, the temples, that they said he should be put to death. We are living in the day and age where the prophets are still being selected to be killed. We are living in the day of and age where you will not be popular for the word that you deliver. We're living in the day and age that they will do the enemy through people will do whatever he can do to unseat you to take you out to close your mouth that's where we are so for those of you under the sound of my voice and wherever this um recording will go know that you are that you've been selected you've been tagged by god but don't think it's a pleasure ride the world don't like you the world don't love you. Jesus said they will hate you because they first hated me. Are you going to allow their displeasure to keep you from doing what the Lord has sent you to do? Are you going to allow their threats to stop you from doing what thus says the living God? Or are you going to stand up, come up out of your, oh, Holy, Holy Spirit, get up out of your wine presses, come up from out of hiding, come and show yourself, come and take that stand, come with the voice of the Lord in your mouth. He is that two-edged sword. Allow your mouth to become that two-edged sword on behalf of the living God in the mighty and matchless of Jesus Christ. And I think I'm going to close in just a couple of minutes. And so Gideon made the right decision. Took a minute, but he made the right decision. And each one of those judges or prophets that ended up making the right decision were instrumental in bringing about peace in their area of, of authority and jurisdiction for a while. The Lord is saying this today to all of us and most everyone in front of my face, I realize are leaders that I can see. He's calling for us to tear down the modern day Asherah poles. He's calling for us today to destroy the temples of Baal so that the world will learn not to go whoring after what is not God, but to come to right fellowship with the living God. Because anything that we are worshiping, anything that we are erecting and giving our attention to is an altar that has been set up. But the world doesn't see it like that because the church, I'm sorry, it's our fault. We gave the right illustration of what the altar is. Romans 12, 1 says, and we know it. He's, the word says that we are to be living sacrifices unto him, that we are 
to show ourselves to be belonging to God, holy and acceptable unto the Lord. Our walk is an altar. Our talk is an altar. Huh? And the way we live is an altar. And we think Oh, I know that the altar, there's an altar even now in heaven where, 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 where the living beings bow down and they say, holy, holy, holy. And they do not stop. And that is a beautiful thing. And there is something called the mercy seat that is in heaven that's running warm with the blood of Jesus Christ right now. I understand that. But we are living epistles. And the Lord is saying, because we are living epistles, then we are those altars that people need to see. If we do not show them the proper sacrifice, sacrifice. If we do not show that we are dead in Christ um, and, and, uh, and alive in him, but dead to the world, they're not going to know what to do. And they're not going to know how to do it. Father, I cast down the spirit of spiritual schizophrenia now with the mighty and matchless name of Jesus Christ. We can't speak one way on Sunday and be a whole other person on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and God knows Saturday. You're not pleased. Father, we cannot make a mockery of your altar and we cannot offer false fire as you give it to me, Father. We cannot be Nadab and Abihu. Oh my God, any fire that don't come from you was called common fire. Any fire that don't come from you was called unholy fire. Any fire that don't come from you was called strange fire. And Father, I'm asking, I'm repenting on, 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 on behalf of the ones who are in front of me even right now, including myself. God, Father, if we offered you anything common, if we offer offered you anything strange, if we offered you anything unholy. Father, I pray even on this day, the most memorable day, when we remember that you have arisen. Father, if you will wash us in your cleansing blood one more time. God, if you will show mercy to us even one more time. God, if you will create in us a clean heart one more time. God, if you will, as we promise, my God, to walk in your ways, do not take your Holy Spirit away from us, oh God, we get it wrong even in our best intentions. But oh God, today this is what we say. We tear down every pole. We burn it up. We grind it to powder. We render their effects useless. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, God, every false temple, every Moloch spirit, Jesus, yeah, my God, pass it through the fire. When you are fire, my God, we sacrifice our children by not teaching them your word. We sacrifice our children by not growing them up in your way. Oh, God, and then unholy fire gets them. Strange fire gets them. We've got systems being spurred by ungodly fire. Father, we repent. God, have mercy, I repent. God, I have that I will show to Teach us to cry out for you again. Teach us to cry out for your way again. Teach us, my God, in the marabou shotoraba sekende araba. God, I see your fire. I see your fire. I see your fire. I see your fire again. God, let your fire roar. Irabou si araba. Jesus. Jesus. I pray that you allow us to receive what you're saying now, to receive what you mean now and be vessels that will carry it out in the name of Jesus Christ. For time is short and time is what it's winding. Jesus, 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 Jesus forth the Josiahs of today. I pray for empowerment that every Josiah will arise. And I assign the name Josiah to be that of a spiritual one, male and female alike, Josiah, arise. Josiah, consult the book. Josiahs, consult the word. Josiahs, tear down every altar that we have erected that did not concern the Lord, that was not authorized. Father, I repent. We repent on behalf of 
every altar that we have erected thinking that we are serving you but we're simply having a form of godliness and denying your power i cast these altars down in the mighty name of jesus christ god you arise you arise and all your enemies be scattered father i pray as you have given me this that those who are given the seer prophet's anointing because lord most of everything that i'm saying you gave it to me through vision let the seer prophets arise let the Hosen prophets arise. Even let the Nadab of prophets, prophets arise. And let those who are not so gifted learn to trust those who have been called to give what thus says the living God visually or audibly. Let respect turn return to the living. Let the, 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 the respect turn return to the house, to your people, O oh God. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Speak, Lord. We again say your we again say your servants are listening. So let Samuels arise again. Let Josiah's arise again. Let the boldness of the prophet Elijah again. Let the double portion of Elisha arise again because you're coming and we need all hands on deck. We need, oh God, that boldness. We need those who are saying yes to you unreservedly. We need those who are willing to destroy ungodly satanic altars. For as we are sacrificing the sacrifice of praise and worship here and now, there is a demonic world that is doing the complete opposite. Father, we will outshine them. Father, we will outwork them. In your name and for your name's sake, in the name of Jesus. I have only this to say. Apostle Liz would, would um say, why didn't I put this for the homework? I, I, I couldn't. Well, not that I couldn't. She said, put your dreams. This wasn't a dream. It was an outright vision, an outright open vision. I saw in the midst of worship, I the Lord opened my eyes and I saw these demons. They were huge. They looked like birds that could stand upright. You could see feathers, you could see feet. But what I, what was most striking were these talons. They were huge. They were ugly, the sickly yellow color. And I, I, I literally saw them jump from their realm into ours. Certainly there were more, but I the two that I saw were enough. And they were walking side by side. And they came in and I saw them grab the throats of certain saints. And I saw them grab like the neck and shoulder of certain others. And I saw them grab, I won't see it, but they, they grabbed them like in the back. And they were immobilizing the saints of God. They were stealing, the Lord showed me the, the voice, the ability to cry out on behalf of the Lord. They were robbing the saints of God of their witness. They were so hurt and so burdened that they spiritually gave up preaching the word of God. And I looked around my own congregation and I realized some of the missing that were missing because they were gripped like this. And then the others that were like this, they wanted to move and they couldn't move. 
And then the ones that were gripped like in behind their, their, their neck and, and back, they were so bowed down with burdens and hurt and shame and pain that they were immobile. But the good news is this. He didn't leave me there in that vision. There is a level of worship that will dispel those demons. And I saw the Lord do it. We were worshiping. The worship was so high. And I saw the talons break loose. And I saw the talons break loose. And I saw the talons break loose. And he said, this is what's happening to my people. This is what's happening. And I didn't know how the Lord was going to tie this vision and what he gave me about the altars that we erect. We've got to be careful of the altars that we erect. Because guess what? We paralyze and mobilize um, our own sons and daughters with improperly handling the altar of the living God, with being insisting on doing what we want to do. We rob somebody of their voice. We rob somebody of their mobility. We rob somebody being, being healed of sickness and disease. So the altars that we erect, We've got no business. We don't even have the authority to erect any altars. We are to come to the altars. Nadab and Abihu, they offered strange fire. The altar was already lit by the fire of God himself. He lit the fire and he said, do not let the fire go out. It's never to go out. So if you're going around with your sensors, lighting the fires because you let the fire go out. And for that, we've got to repent. For that, we've got to repent and ask the Lord to light the fire and be careful, careful, careful not to let it go out again. God, I stretch myself out on this altar now. The good news is this as I close, because I don't know where else to go. I think he said what he needed to say. As I saw those two demons, huge, very huge, in myself, in yourself, in any of ourselves, we were no match for them. But I'm glad for the God that I serve. They came, those demons came, they came with their talons, but this is what I saw. I saw an angel literally do like this. I saw the Lord dispatch an angel and all I saw was this. And he appeared up in front of those demons. He was huge and white. He was simply light. And I saw him just do like this. And I don't know, it's not naturally possible for what, for what he did because they were, the demons were facing me. The angel, when he rose up, he, his back was to me, but he came up like this and he came up like this and he did like, and that was the end of those two demons. That was the end of those creatures. They had to go. Will the enemy fight you? Yes, he will. Because the moment I gave that vision, I went home. I was so tired and I went to lay down. Those same two or maybe another two, but they look alike to me. And this is what I want you to see. Altars always have fire. They always have fire related to them. And there's always death attached. When we die in Christ, it is, a, it is a glorious death. And what I, I mean to self. I know one day we're going to be with the Lord, but I mean when we allow ourselves to be sacrificed on that altar, it's, it's glorious. But those demons carry a fire too, and I saw it. I saw it. And how to explain fire? I saw fire that was dead at the same time. So it was lit up, but it was dead at the same time. I saw them. I was trying to fall asleep. And all of a sudden, I became aware that something said, Woof. And when I looked, I saw those bird like creatures. 
coming towards me, coming at me on my bed where I was laying. Behind them was this wall of flames behind them, walking with them. The crackling, you can hear it. The color, I could see it. They came to challenge the warning that I gave. But how many of you know God is faithful? And it literally took one blood of Jesus, get out of here, and they were gone. They never reached me. But they came. My point is they're going to try you. But are you going to be willing to stand on what God said? Are we going to disallow the altars that have been erected? Are we going to destroy the altars that we know about? And some of us, that means destroying some crap that we got in our homes. It's not always an article. I'm just pulling, holding my phone because that's close to me. It's not always an article, you know, something of material. It's our mentalities. It's our attitudes. God says today, the altars that we erect or have erected, they must come down. They must be destroyed. They must be ground to powder. And it must be consigned to the things that are common because God is calling us to be pure, to be holy to be sanctified and to represent him. I will not go any further. I believe I said all that he meant and anything that I failed, I ask for forgiveness now. But as for right now, I'm saying amen and thanks be unto God in Jesus' name. No. Are we all right? Uh, before we go further, I know uh, Prophet Wani is closing, but I really wanted to respect. Sir, hold on. Can you turn it off? That's being hurt. We're on live. So I want us to hear what God, she had stated at the beginning about altars. And she spoke what an altar is and where what happens there. I want to release this because I can't, I, I really heard this in reference to what she was saying. In Jeremiah 17, 9 through 10, it says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. And I, I, I hear this over and over again. And we probably said this and she talked about evil altars even in our mindsets towards the end. And I really just, it just kept confirming. God knows me. I love when people say that as a justification. It's an evil altar. It's a justification to continue walking in our ways of sin, to not even try to be separated. When something is, is sacrificed in the altar, if you notice, she talked about slaughter. Slaughter. There's a lot of things that need to be slaughtered, and she talked about our mindsets at the end. So God knows my heart. God knows me. It is a way for us to continue to have God adjust to us instead of adjusting to him and what he's asking us and what he wants. According to the fruit of his doings, that means we have our doings that we want to continue doing and we want to come to the altar like, like it's nothing. It's a place of slaughter. It's a place of sacrifice. Something must die. And our evil altars start here in our own hearts. Our evil altars start here in our minds. She led with that. She talked about the slaughtering. And altars have become such a fluffy place. And he talked to me about, and I don't know if you've had this, but I've heard this over and over again. I passed up to the altar on Sunday and I got goose pimples all around. Who gives a crap? 
if you got goose pimples all around, if you haven't been slaughtered, all the you got a feeling, but you didn't die. And when you die, you don't have feelings anymore. <clears throat> and so today I'm, I'm really asking us to come to the altar and let him slaughter. Let him slaughter mindsets. Let him slaughter traditions. Let him slaughter all these things in you that you've created as an evil altar. Because if you ain't worshiping God at the altar, she was clear, you're worshiping Satan. And if your feelings and what you want to do come before Jesus, again, you're worshiping Satan. It's an evil altar. It's something that you have erected as justification to not surrender and be slaughtered and die to self. And so I really felt that, that today we need to really ask him to slaughter, slaughter everything not like you, slaughter every thought not like you, slaughter every tradition that I've participated, I renounce and slaughter everything that has to do with witchcraft, has to do with tradition, has to do with culture, anything not like you, slaughter it in us and through us today. That we don't come to the altar with a justification of pray for me so I can get a good feeling and not die to self. This is about slaughtering. This is about dying. This is about all the evil altars that were even resurrected and erected in our lives generations ago. So anything that my grandparents, their grandparents, their great grandparents, anything that has come through the bloodline, even in evil altars that have been established way before I was even a thought kill it today, slaughter it today, that from me on, we are cleansed with the blood of the lamb and we die to self today. We die, we die to self. Erect a true revelation and meaning of your altar that when we come to the altar, whether it be in our homes or we're on services in our altars in the different ministries we belong to, that we honor and reverence the altar, the place of slaughter, the place of sacrifice, the place where every single altar that was established in the word, there was something supernatural that happened and the natural had to die. The flesh had to be sacrificed. And so today I, I heard her and, and I heard God through the message. And I, I just want any remnant of a natural, spiritual, evil altar in my life I need it. Me personally, maybe not you, but I need it to be slaughtered. I need it to be slaughtered. I don't want a remnant of Liz. Liz is absolutely unimportant. And I just, I just want us to respect that. When we come to him, to the altar, whether you're on your sofa, whether you're in a car, whether you're at home, whether you're in your ministry, that we come right to the altar. Because as they're praying for you, that you have the true understanding and revelation that slaughtering has to happen for the sacrifice to be real. That's all I have for wandering.